this your girl don't call me white girl aka la mona aka the big crip i was on the 60s last night with a, with a bunch of gangsters ain't that right gary gary was scared a little bit because he changed a lot but it was cool we had a good time we have a huge guest in the building y'all know i love la so why not slide on the west coast nigga jason lee is in the building give it up for jason lee Like deja vu, like we just did that. Ain't that crazy? <laughs> it seems memorable. How are you? Listen, I love LA, but LA is super duper dreary. It yeah. snowed last week. Yeah, um, snowing, hailing, raining. Uh, people run up in people's houses. Shout out to the Crips and the Blood. Shout out to everybody <laughs> out there. All the street folks. I, I love y'all from a distance. Mm -hmm, for sure. It's so snow in LA. That's not the first time, but it's a big I've deal. I've never seen snow in LA until this year. Are you serious? Like snow like in neighborhoods like Rancho Cucamonga and the Valley. Yeah, I've never seen snow. This is a place when I moved here, it used to be like 115, 118 degrees during the summer. Winter was like 90, 85. Now it's actually freezing. Yeah, it's spooky. I was like when I, because I was, we looked at the weather before we got out here, because of course you got a pack, and I'm like, damn, we coming to LA on the dreariest fucking time. I don't know. When does the summer start out here? In the actual summer, like the spring? I don't even know when summer started, because there were years where it was always summer. Like, this was a place where you could wear shorts and flip-flops during, in January or December. Now, sure. at night, it's freezing. You gotta have a coat. Last night, I, yeah, I had a coat on last night. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's cold. So you're originally from Northern California. Northern California. You tip, A city called Stockton, uh, one of the top 10 most dangerous cities in the country. It's dreary. It rains a lot out there. It don't snow. But yeah, I'm used to that type of weather back home. When I moved out here, I didn't have to wear coats no more. But now, like, I got a closet full of coats. How far is L.A. from Stockton now? It's about six hours oh, driving. Wow. Yeah, 45, so, 50, five minute flight. So it's still that definite, that feeling like you moved to L.A. for big dreams. Absolutely. Yeah. So Absolutely. I know a little bit about your background. Um, you've been open about your background as far as being in foster care, um, dealing with different situations um, with your family or whatever. Do, how long did you know you were going to be like, at what point did you know you were going to be in entertainment from the door? Like you could see through the stock and shit and know you're going to make it big? Yeah. No, I mean, I kind of always had an affection for pop culture, culture, uh, celebrity life like i ever since i was a kid i talked about in my book um that i used to put word up magazine on my room like my whole wall in my room was of word up magazine posters or articles that, that old like, school shit we yeah. tell your age yeah magazines I'm 45 years old i'm an old nigga so are like, you yeah i'm 45 you know jason yeah, yeah and i'm out here drinking all this water <laughs> and Botox but yeah no I mean you know what I mean like I used to cover my wall with the magazines and so like you know the whole Prince Michael Jackson era and and I don't know I just kind of fell in love with it but I was always afraid to pursue my dreams because when you get a good job you know growing up in the hood and you don't got nothing in foster care where you've lost everything and when you get a good job where you're making 5000 every other week that's you rich for sure. If you're from the hood. So, like, for me to quit a job to go pursue my dreams where I would start with nothing was something that I just didn't want to do. So, eventually, you know, once I got down here with my job and was kind of hanging out on the scene, I had built up enough relationships. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to just go for it. Yeah. I, I just was talking about this recently. I feel like growing up in the ghetto, because now it's the new thing is you manifest. You can manifest this life that you never thought you would have. But I don't think people understand unless you have that experience. When you grow up in the ghetto, it almost feels like the people that make it are super lucky, like a lottery thing. Mm -hmm. Or they're really, really talented. Because there's a lot of talent in the ghetto. Everybody knows that. But those guys that play basketball really, really well can make it out the ghetto. Or that guy that raps really, really good. Because in Philly, everybody rap. Mm -hmm. My grandmother raps. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a thing. So you being able to rap isn't enough to make you feel like you'll make it out of Philadelphia. you know. And I think that's what the ghetto does to your brain. It kind of it conditions you to believe that you can only make it certain ways so you kind of settle a lot because it's like you don't even want to feel the pain of failure you know mm -hmm. your dreams will get shot down in the hood faster than anywhere else and it's not a we hate you thing it's just like you know we don't make it out of this and you know god forbid you dream too much and then you're disappointed you know mm -hmm. i always say that about people from the hood and i also think it gives you a certain amount of strength tenacity but to me foster kids are even more that way like Every person that I knew that grew up in foster care, even in and out of it, they have a certain kind of strength, like a survival thing. And it's not always a positive. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But they do what they got to do by any means necessary and they make it out. Do you feel like that impacted you in a way? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I feel like every everything I've gone through from being shot, watching my brother die, molested, abandoned, foster care, um, everything. I use it as, it's strength for me. Like mm -hmm. I look at everything in the industry. When I come out here and get rejected, like, 
I get rejected all the time. Mm -hmm. I get rejected. I've been rejected by my parents. I've been rejected by my community. I've been rejected by black people, white people. So for me, a rejection is just, it's, a, it's kind of like I laugh in the face of it because like now I'm approved to you that I could do it. And I really feel like the thing that gives me the most drive is when people have said like, you can't do it, you ain't gonna do it, ain't no room for you, you ain't talented enough, so-and-so's better, so-and-so's this or that, whatever. But you know, again, I believe like what God got for you, he got for you. And all the shit I went through really gave me not just the testimony and the will to do it, but also like the the thing that is now inspiring other people that they could do it too. Because mm -hmm, you definitely motivate, and that's what I realized in my journey. I've motivated so many people I didn't even think that mm -hmm. was watching. Um, but I, you said something I wanted to talk about because I always want to talk about some podcasts I constantly forget. At some point in my career, people, the naysayers, it started to kind of drive me. So I would have this feeling of, my mother does it all the time. Like my mother plans for how when we're like super rich, how she's going to cut off our sisters and shit. And she already has like her text thread ready for how she's going to send it. But I have a good friend. That's my OG, Triple OG, Wallow. I'm sure you know Wallow. Yeah, yeah. Wallow told me a long time ago, like, yo, don't never let that negative shit be your fire because it'll come back to negativity. It kind of comes back in a circle. And I never looked at it like that because that anger, like that, like y'all will see, it, it drove me a lot. Like I, I hate it on you too. <laughs> yes, know, he did. Let's you know, tell a story. I, I hate it on you too. Go, let's get, let's get into it. Get into it. No, wait a minute. We're going to go all the way backwards now. First, because <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you, because first I was going to go at you on the internet, but I changed my mind because I didn't know if I was going to win. Really? Yes, I was going to go at you on the internet, but let me tell you why. So listen, so first off, you had a book signing Kay. in a small, tiny town, Wilmington, Delaware, Delaware uh -huh. with your girlfriend at the time, Patience, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. I come to the book signing. I don't like her already. I'm just tell y'all right now. Dre, I come to the book signing. I'm there. I had on a little shirt with lapels on it. My hair was freshly curled. I'm like, let me go look good for Jason Lee. We we listen. Had a ball. Um, you and Patience talk because I think you might have did it twice. But the one I went to, we talked about the book. No, I did it that one time. Oh, okay, it was uh -huh. one. So uh -huh. see, it was special. I was in the building. Mm -hmm. So I come up to you. Now you were shady, but I deserved it. Let me tell you why. And it's so dumb because people that approach me like this piss me off so bad. So I don't know why I approach you like this so we talking right in philadelphia a, a lot of the corner stores are bodegas they earned by poppy so in philly it's real common to say what's up pop anybody that you think is spanish in any kind of way you'll say poppy don't matter columbia dominic whatever i say to you something something yeah pop sort of around and say what you call me i said pop like poppy you a poppy right you said girl no i'm not a poppy i am black and then looked at my foot and then my head and my foot no, again. No, I did not. And spent that no, head like I that. No, I did not. But I deserved it because I called you. I called you okay, a poppy. Okay, first of all, you, first of all, I apologize for that. But let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you one of my struggles and what I love about you because I was downstairs singing your praises. Um, I was downstairs in the basement um, singing your. <laughs> 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 I was singing your praises because don't call me white girl. So many people call me white boy. So many people call me Spanish. So many people tell me I ain't black enough to stand for black issues or, you know, you too white. Don't say nigga Mexican. I'm like, yo, I'm like proud to be black. For I'm sure, proud to be black. black. I stand in my blackness. I promote black. I employ black. I fight for black, black journalists, black creators. I'm like constantly trying to push the black agenda. And people will always say poppy and even though it's love, it's almost like, damn, like, y'all, nigga, you didn't see it either? Like, what is happening, you know? And and so I, you probably hit me on that day where mm -hmm. I go online and all day, it's, you're a colorist, you're you're this, you're, yeah. you're Mexican. And so, yeah, I wanted you to say, what's up, nigga? Yeah, like, what's and up? I'm so, I'm always misjudged like that. People always think, because the don't call me white girl thing is like. But I was rude like that? I'm, I did, was, did it come off rude or did, was it fun, I'm Shay? from Philly. I'm from Philly, so. Where I'm from, if it's valid, it's valid. So it's not judged. Yeah, but I'm, that's not even my energy. Like not that. Like, no, and, and that I, event was so nice. Like people were so good and everybody loved you. Yeah, they loved me. I felt the that's love. That's why so. I ran up like. Grr! Puppy. <laughs> it was like, bitch, no, calm down, no. But it was funny because. It was so hypocritical of me because it's happened so much. And see, now my mother, my mo people would walk up to my mother just speaking Spanish. My mom all black too. And she would get real frustrated about it. So I know that you don't do that. Wait, so are you all black? I'm all black. My um, And do people challenge your blackness? For sure. Right. Especially since this, people, you I just think you don't black because you got girl. black kids, bitch. You ain't, you know, because you got a bob and you got black kids. People don't even believe that I'm really a black woman. Like a lot of people see me and I'm not to shade them or whatever, but the way they do bad baby and um, what's the other white girl? 
Well, Vicky. Well, Vicky. Uh-huh. They do mean to say, they say the same really? thing. Some people say the same thing, especially if they don't know anything other than a viral clip. Because that's how I really went big going viral about talking yeah. about something crazy or yeah. salacious. So they don't really know. But once you get to know me a little bit of my shit, you know I'm a black woman. But for me to be me, that was like totally not my style. But, you know, when you meet people, especially for me, it's like meeting people that are famous, people that I watch because I watched you on Love and Hip Hop. That's what I knew you from. Yeah. So even when she said a book sign, I'm like, hey, that nigga write books? <laughs> and we went there. But see, reading your book and getting to know, and it's so crazy. I didn't even realize you were the same person with the Queen Latifah story. Can you tell the Queen Latifah yeah, story? Yeah. yeah. So I came home from, uh, well, first of all, let me apologize. Because oh, if it please, came off Jason. as shade, I'm not even... A, there's like the persona people have of me from loving hip hop, throwing drinks, throwing shade and this and that. And you know, there's days where like, if you film me for eight hours and in 30 minutes, somebody does some dumb shit and you gotta go somewhere, you like this bitch, that's what's gonna make the air. So people for years thought like I was the most evil, mean, not, not messy person. And I do give you messy sometimes and sometimes I'm an asshole, but for me to intentionally be rude to somebody showing me love, that's just not my character. So if I was, I apologize. No, save that. The apology is okay. later. you could have been with second. Crips. I could have been robbed <laughs> in the parking lot. I ain't had no security that save day. Save the apology for the second thing. This one, is, I think you was well within your right. But the second thing you can say. So the Queen Latifah story. Okay, so Queen Latifah. So I get home from foster care. Uh, now, like, the, the neighborhood, fair, the city fair is going. So they like, Queen Latifah's coming to I'm like, okay, I'm going to go meet Queen Latifah. I go down to the fair. I sneak backstage. I just like her vibe. We talking shit. I'm like, yo, give me your number. And she was like, nah, nigga, I'm not giving you my number. Like, what the fuck? So I was like, because you, you the queen? Like, because you the queen. I, are you too good to give me your number? Fuck it then. Okay. She said, if it's meant to be, nigga, you'll find me. She drives away. That's literally what she's saying. She hang out the window. You know, she got her hair back in a ponytail. She did look like Cleo. Did you? But she, but, <laughs> but she was on Living Single at the time. So three days later, I, I got shot in the drive-by. Crazy. So I'm in the hospital. So I'm like, your dad, give me a phone. I took a cell phone. At the time, 411 was a big deal. I called around. I knew she was on Fox. So I called Fox and I said, let me, uh, I need to talk to Queen Latifah. Like, I'm her cousin, just got shot. They were like, she's, doesn't, she's not here. She's at Warner Brothers. They gave me that number, called. Uh, they gave it to the executive producer. They ran to her trailer. She wasn't there, but then she called right back and uh, she was like panicking about like, why would you say people, you you got shot? I'm like, I really did fucking get shot, bitch. Right, I'm in the right, right. So at the time, this is when we all had pagers. So I'm giving you my age. It was years ago. So that's 30 years ago. So she gave me her Sky Pager number, Pager when I got the hospital, came down to live in single with all my friends. And then after that, I just kept coming back and forth to LA. And it was eye opening that you would see so many people that look like me not killing each other. Or, robbing each other, selling drugs and working right. and being successful. So I, um, yeah, just gravitated towards her and just, just started coming back and forth. Do you all still talk now? Yeah, yeah I just talked lit. to her the other day when I, when I, the first day, uh, the first day, the first episode of the Jason Lee show aired, which is now on Revolt, she called. And she's not a phone person, so like, she'll get your text, she may like it, you send her something from your Instagram, you'll go, she'll like the Instagram, she'll let you know she sees it, but she's not a phone person, she don't talk on the phone all the time. But the day my uh, show aired, she did call and we had a long conversation about like, you know, stop giving people that stop giving everybody your flowers because it's your turn to receive the flowers. You mm. put in the work, you know, you, you've you been doing this since She's I met saying you. you come up for real, for real, for real, for real. Yeah. I met her one time and I, I almost fanned out. Gary, you remember we go to see um, my friend Lee Daniels play. What's the name of the play, Gary? Ain't no more. Oh, Great play. Yeah, yeah. She was there. She walked, I'm faced this way. I'm sitting behind Clive Davis. She sits, she grabs me like this, an oh, entire hug. She leans in, hi, Faith. And I turn around and go, oh Faith, my. Faith Evans? Faith Evans. Stop it. And people Dana. call me that all the time. But she, when she seen me, she was just so like mortified. She just ran off. But I'm like, I like you a lot. It's nice meeting you. She apologized. Wait, Julian, give me my phone. Yeah, call her because like we need. She ain't to gonna answer, this. but I'm gonna do a video with Faith and send it to her. Yeah, t- <laughs> she thought I was Faith. It was so fucking funny. But Queen Latifah is huge, and she looks exactly the same in real life. She's really a nice looking lady. She's, you know, the thing about her and I, like even growing up, I was I look skinnier on t- on the photos, but I was like 190 pounds because I'm th- I'm big bone. She's big bone, but yeah. she looks good. Doesn't yeah. she look great? Yeah, you definitely lost weight though. I, I feel like you lost 20 pounds. You lost 120 pounds? Yeah. Guess what? What? I lost 100 pounds in like 2017. Guess what I did? What? Gained it back, John. No, you did. But guess what I've read? This is the crazy part. Statistically, if you lose a, a, a fair amount of weight, we talking about 50 and up, guess how long, statistically, all of us usually keep that weight off? How long? Five years. Guess when I gained it back? When? 
the fourth and a half year. Ain't that about a bitch? But did you? If I would have read that before that, I would have been on some shit eating grapes for a day. How did you lose the weight though? I did a little something. But see, I did surgery. I did a little something too. We ain't really? gotta get all into it. I'm okay. going bad. You know what everybody doing to lose weight now? The needle in the belly, diabetes medication. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm on that right now. Too. I knew it. I wasn't. Let me see your belly, nigga. Everybody got prox and I'm prunes. on that too. Send me the number because yeah, I'm I ready. I got you. I got a good. It doctor. fucking works. But you know what though? I when I got the surgery and I went to lose the weight, my team was like, "Just tell everybody that you were in the gym." Nah, bitch. They see Fuck me in the gym no. for the last twenty years. I ain't yeah. lost a fucking pound. I went over there to the good old Houston, had that good old surgery Sleep. for eleven thousand dollars. Damn right. Yeah. But the thing is, when he told me that people gained the weight back, Yo. terrified me. Hold well, on, let me tell you. Mm. Got them good doctors with all the right needles i do my micronutrient testing every every uh like six months i'm on uh, stem cell i do the hgh i do the testosterone i do all that shit. i manage my weight i manage my i hired a chef like i did everything to make sure that i stay healthy because right. i was pre-diabetic i had inflammation i had all types of medical things creeping over me and then when everybody was dying around me with covid i'm like fuck that i ain't ready yeah. to go yet so yeah but yeah. that's where the joke stops people that get what we talking about is weight loss surgery that used to be real popular for the gastric bypass that's unpopular nobody nobody does anymore right, but right. those sleeves people get them sleeves in the next month they don't have diabetes anymore like that shit no, I lost. Works. it was it, everything went away right yeah. and it's crazy though because um they don't a lot of people don't talk about when they go bad and it's this huge network of people on the internet they're like connected hashtag oh, it's a whole community yeah they're weird once I, motherfucker, bitch. i'm not talking to you protein bitches I'm right and then no they protein. want you and then they want you to do a testimony like they want you to tell your whole story ah, none of yeah. your business bitch but i feel like <laughs> it's up to you you gauge that i am totally pro pro plastic surgery i always was chubby always was big i always had plans on working on this working on that the boom of it now is is shocking to me. You know what I just noticed all up and down my timeline? What? Every black girl I follow got fake lips. We the ones with the lips. Wait, why are they? How are they getting fake? Everybody, lips? not fake lips, but it's it's gotten really popular with black women to get lip injections. Really? And it's so crazy. I had somebody on my glam team get them, and I was like, "Damn, you cute as shit with these." Like this is that fucking boost you up two three points bitch you should have been did that right and it didn't even phase me but now that i'm noticing everybody doing it i'm like damn it must be on groupon or something because bitches is getting that shit top lip no bottom because you know we got lips i think social media is making everybody weird about how they look what they weigh uh i will say like for me i do struggle with body dysmorphia because me too me I, too jason I, I, I lost i was 323 pounds I, I went all the way when boy when you met me no, 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 no. Absolutely. You were no 323 then. That was like 20. Yeah, 2019. 20 maybe. 2019. It was 2019. Yeah. You couldn't have been 323 300 pounds. Then I lost all the weight, got down to 206. And then I then I started seeing all the comments and like, oh, he's lost too much weight. He's too skinny. He's dying. He got AIDS. I'm like, damn, I went from losing weight But guess what I'm going to give you? Fuck. But guess what I'm going to give you? I just passed HIV, went straight to AIDS. Like, damn, you niggas. So then I gained 17 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> then I gained 17 pounds. I was 222. And then I felt like I was overweight again. So then oh now I'm back God. down to 205. This is the thing about you, because I think we had that in common. You didn't get that, like turkey neck i had weight loss surgery look to you you look good with it because i just was like damn you slim down he look good you know it never it never slid across to Some me that you really like had anything balloon. it's like fuck i mean you notice people have these huge you know lost a lot of weight in front of Wait, me don't, i feel don't like say no name because if you say it then they gonna say me talking about people about losing weight who what can we do it later who, no who? cliff the rapper Oh yeah, I don't Clip really know Cliff is tiny <laughs> he had the surgery he used to do hair remember he did hair he had to show on bt you don't know cliff a rapper that does hair? God damn, Jason. Well, uh, you know me, right? I, of course I know you. Well, we in the clear. But yeah, he lost a lot of we weight. But we, this is the this is the thing. I met so Styles P years you're ago. You're saying he looks weird now? I don't think that he looks weird, but he looks very, very small. And people are harassing him about it. That's oh, what I was okay, getting to. Okay, okay. Like, me gaining that weight in front of the camera, like, they just out, just rip you apart in the comments. You know what I mean? Like, they don't even think anything of it. And with me, I realized a lot of things about myself losing that weight. I realized about the body dysmorphia because I never even felt really tiny. When I look back now, I was really, really small. Um, and I also know that I will never be what they say and then gauge it because it's going to go crazy then. They're never going to be satisfied with it. So for me, as long as I find a way where I feel like it's easier to do shit, mm -hmm. run up the steps, do whatever I got to do, run around with the kids, I'm kind of cool with that and if I could fit clothes because I think that's the worst part about being a big girl for me. It was like the clothes. the clothes don't yeah. fit. The clothes that are made for you, a bunch of flowers on them, it's giving curtain, it's giving <laughs> tablecloth. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And 
It's either that or like you in the airport and you all stuffed the fuck up and it's your side, your roles that are inhibiting it. And I went, this is the worst part about it. I got skinny. I went on this long tour about fat bitches don't really have wet pussy. It's just sweat. Now I'm back in the fat bitch sweat club. Hilarious. God, it's true. Fat girls do have good coochie, but a lot of they are cracking up. That girl. Y'all like me. Follow me. <laughs> Follow me, everybody. Well, you listen, y'all chuckling. Uh, you can laugh. Imagine, imagine, laugh. imagine sitting on the reunion couch next to Soldier Boy. I mean, I had on this jacket that we found in a fucking bin downtown in a China shop with Chinese print on. They thought it was foreign. They thought it was some kind of designer from a foreign country. No, it was some shit from a Japanese box, uh, box, some bin over here because we couldn't find clothes to fit. Now I can fit everything when I walk in yeah, the store. Yeah. But also, it's, it's more about like, how do you feel versus how do I look to people? Some people are going to say, I don't look good now. I didn't look good then. I got money. I'm doing great. I don't give a fuck what they think. Right. But I do look at that scale now. Like, I don't yeah. know. I'm obsessed with the scale. When that shit go from 205 to 205.5, I'm like, what the fuck did I eat That's yesterday? That's rough. Yeah. That's rough, Jason. I, I, I want to in this because I am new to the fame thing and the limelight thing, and it just so happened when it came to me, I was a little bitch, and now I'm choking because most of the time when they say it, like you fat bitch, I'm like I've been fat, nigga. Scroll down a little bit, like what the fuck, y'all. It's new to y'all, but it's not new to me, you know. Um, for for sure, I don't want to ever get back to the point of like that. Like I had Mike. My ass would hurt. Like I had my ass was so small that it would hurt if I sat too long. And then like my, when I would wear shorts, it gave like chicken breasts. Really? I have a fat ass now, and I want to stay with the fat ass, but I have booty do. What does booty do? Your butt stick out, your belly stick out more than your booty do. Hilarious. So I'm trying to reverse that. That's not a joke. I'm trying to reverse that and hand it in. But this is so crazy. This is the crazy part. These bitches got so many bad jobs that it kind of scared me to get the BBL thing. I always thought that's what I wanted. Tummy tuck, new ass. But it's like, yo, the thighs and the way these bitches look in person is stressing me out, bro. You know what I mean? They don't look good. They think they do. No, they don't. Yes, no, they, they don't. Do. Yes, no, they, they don't. Do. That's why they take them pictures like that and they angle shit like that because they know that shit ain't right on certain but angles. Th but now, let me tell you, Libby, stay in L.A. for a little while. Go to Hollywood. At first, I thought, because when I moved to L.A., I was in every club. I was at every Jamie Foxx party, this party, that party. And I thought, in my mind, I didn't even, I, I come from Stockton, so regular people, yeah. beautiful people, whatever. Right. Then I went to New York for six months and I realized that I had a, a morphed perception of what beauty looks like. Uh -huh. Like the plastic out here is just what they, you know, they want to fuck the, a credit card. I went to the bowling alley. Them bitches look so much alike. I thought I was tripping. Like I would meet one. Oh, I'm a big fan. I mean, I'm like, bitch, I just met you in the bathroom. They all look alike. Yeah. That's that Kardashian body. Yeah, it's the Kardashian look. Yeah. The long black hair, the big souped up lips, the real big fat ass. Uh -huh. I'm like, damn. And all the broke niggas in LA that can't get a Kardashian, they go for them. That's why I said I probably stick out with this gut because I'm real. Like I'm down. Yeah, but you somebody know, looking for some authenticity. You but, know what I mean? But, but I feel like men love thick girls. I mean, for you know. sure. Because when I had, I had no ass, nobody opened the door for me. You know what I mean? Like people hold the door with the elbow, mm -hmm. they would slam it in the face when you don't have no ass. When you have ass, it's an automatic. You thirsty, you want something to drink, niggas look after you. And when you don't have an ass? It's totally different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm so gay. I don't even know. Like, I, I know you are. Really when I gay. see all the girls with the asses, I'm like, congratulations. Whether you bought it or you built it, or when you, did you come out, Jason? Before entertainment, see, or I don't really think I came out. I, I just, don't think so either. Yeah, I just don't think I came out. I mean, I, when I was back home, I had a nigga nobody knew about because I had a girl. It was more about like I don't want to be cheating on my girl, but yeah, I just happened to be cheating on her with a nigga. Oh, so and, you used to date women too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. she fucked that up for everybody. Why she, she put, I put her name in my book too. I didn't know you wasn't supposed to put people real names in the book. Yeah. Because I want the nigga she dated now to know that she ain't. Now, he thinks she's not shit now. Right. But now he's going to look back 30 or whatever, 27 years like ago and realize she like really this. ain't been shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? She's a cheater? Um, no, she's just a real negative, nasty. I mean, she her parents look miserable. So I think they had a miserable child. Mm -hmm. um, she became really miserable. Last time I saw her, she was actually eating that Red Lobster. I haven't been in Red Lobster in years. I, I, I used to like one of Red Lobster. I don't go there anymore. But she was there with her mom. Her mom still looked real pathetic. But yeah, I wrote about her <laughs> in the book. I ended up cheating on her. I was with a nigga, and then he had a girl. He was living with his baby mom across mm -hmm. the street from me. So we had this, like, little love thing going, whatever. So I, then once I fell in love with him, I knew, like, okay, I like niggas then. I'm, I'm off that, and I started exploring shit. Then I just found uh, San Francisco. Then I was oh, out. Wow. Yeah, then once I hit San Francisco, it was like. It was we, over. We gay every Thursday, Friday, Saturday. 
Sunday we go to church, everybody in the church gay. Like it was just gay. Yeah. And then when I moved to LA, everything was gay. I was like, fuck, I'm in West Hollywood. Yeah, fuck it. Yeah, because yeah. I heard you crack a joke. Like I'm looking for these niggas that they say I fly out because that's what they say in the comments. Oh, no, no, just no, but I do niggas fly niggas out. out. There's nothing wrong with that. See, those are only broke people who say shit like that. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of niggas are conditioned to being treated like shit by their girl, by their mama, their daddy, their community. Everybody treat them like shit. So a nigga like me fly them out. There's a chef cooking meals for him every day. We, I'm not going to go out wearing uh what am i got on today helmet lang or or dior and you got on h&m h&m is cool if that's what we own but we gonna be on h&m together but if i'm gonna be out in designer why you can't be out in designer you're a reflection of me your nigga is a reflection of you your girl you is a reflection of you. No, no but i'm just saying so like <laughs> and and here's the other thing here's the other thing let me ask you a question if you saw me randomly walking down the street in philly you'll be like what the fuck is jason lee doing out here for me to fly out <laughs> to the Bronx, like, what am I going to just be walking in the Bronx for? No, nigga, fly to L.A., meet me. I flew a nigga, he met me in Dubai. Nigga got caught with cocaine uh, somewhere on Damn, the way back. But on the way back? He went with, it wasn't, I mean, I don't yeah, do that shit. Yeah, they don't fuck around over yeah, there with that shit, I don't shit, do the though. white girl. This the only white, you know, yeah, don't call me white girl. But yeah. yeah, no, I don't, uh, yeah, yeah, they say I fly him out, but I do. Yeah. I, I'm not ashamed to say I fly him what, what, what shame is that? They, didn't, they not on Spirit. They're not on Allegiant. They're not on Frontier. So where's the shame in flying somebody out? I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, are you single? Very. Yeah. Do you date? Would you date anybody in the industry or no? You would rather like I regular? I kind of did guy? that already. You know, like I don't even fuck with nobody really no more. Like I'm, I'm really like I woke up today saying, I try to genuinely be cool with everybody, but I feel like like a lot of celebrities now are trying to become friends because they don't want me to write about them or they want me to write about them. Damn. Like the ones that don't get talked about want to be my friend, so I would talk about them. And then the ones that get talked about like shit want to become my friend because I'm fair. I am fair, but I'm still going to talk my shit. Right. So recently I, I was talking my shit about some somebody and um, I'm going to tell you a story. You know what's so crazy? Tell I'm going to just go ahead and tell you. I'm laying in bed one day. I think I was in New York City and the song... Because girls like players too mm -hmm. came up. Mm -hmm. I saw this is cute. You know, I'm not on TikTok, but I fuck with Koi Larry. I think she's cute. I think she. I like Koi too. She's doing everything. She's Koi, you know, I love you. I just unfollowed her though, and I'm going to tell you why. I wanted that bitch to come on the show. I can't get through to her. I'll text her. She's probably not going to respond after she sees this, but whatever. Okay. But I love, but let me preface this. And this is the part where people struggle with liking me. Right. I love her. I love her movement. I love <clears throat> all her TikTok energy. I love that she. Stands for body positivity and, you know, for young women with small bodies and all that, whatever, you know, whatever. Um, so I have the Jason Lee show. Cardi B is the first guest. So I hit Coyle Ray. Like, oh, no, I'm in my room in New York because girls like players. And I post it just genuinely because it's, it's free and it's free promo. I don't ever post shit for free. I got to get paid for everything. But I just did it because I liked it. Right. Tagged her. She reposted it. I fo she followed me. I followed her. So once the Blueface and Krishan interview aired, she called me like, oh, I want to do the show, but like, that's not a good look. You, you big, like you, you, you influential, like you that nigga, like we want to celebrate you. You just had a big interview with Cardi B and then you interview Blueface and Krishan. Like, I can't come on right. That's not good. Pause, 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 pause. Let me ask you that before you keep going. She called you and said that to you? Yes. Wow. That's crazy. So I said, well. Uh, Koi, I'm in the business of interviewing people. So, like, whether I'm interviewing... And Blueface Krishan's going to do numbers because they're hot right now. For fucking sure. But see, I didn't know she used to mess around with Blueface. Right. And I didn't, know that, I didn't know that Krishan said she was going to beat her ass when she saw her. Yeah. So that's the thing where you want to be cool with me. You want to be on my platform talking to millions of people and on Revolt and all in the world of everything. We're getting mil millions of impressions, billions of impressions for his stories. But now you tainted the relationship that you could have built because you were mad at Blueface and Christian for coming on the show. So I saw her at Moneybag Yo's party. And this is how I'm going to show you that I'm not shady. So I had my own table. It was paid for. I paid for my own table. I don't you take free tables. I have my own table. She was at a table. They brought out her sign, whatever. But when Ari walked in, the party, they made it. I mean, she just kind of left the table. So I don't know if she left early and gave her table to Ari, but Ari then took that table. I didn't go post that on Hollywood a lot. My team, everybody filmed it all. We could have made it a whole messy thing. So the whole messy Jason thing is not a real thing. People will watch this and go, see, he's being messy right now. I'm just being real. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like what I'm experiencing now is that people know that when we, me, Shade Room, Ball Alert, when those of us stop talking about them, their albums are affected, their, their movies are affected, the sales of the, whatever they put out are affected. The culture loses, its attention span is very short. So if you're not constantly in people's faces, people will forget about you unless you have this like NBA young boy 
type following or whatever. That's one of a kind. Though. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's one of a kind. So I always say to people, like, if you want to be a friend of mine or friendly with me, just build a genuine relationship. We're going to have good days, bad days. You're going to like what I do, not like what I do, but don't be fake. To me, I thought that was fake. So now she's the only guest to ask us to pay for her glam. She's the only guest to ask us to pay for her car. I mean... I just had coffee with the vice president of the United States. She didn't ask me to get her hair done or get her a car. Actually, mm -hmm. she brought a whole bunch of cars with her. They were secret services and of FBI's course. and all that. But that's not the point. My point is that, like, this is an industry where we already have a relationship. You have a relationship with every celebrity in the world because you talk about them. Sure. If they want to participate, that's their choice. So whether they choose to participate or not is their choice. But for me, I still have a job to do, and it's unfortunate that we couldn't share her talent with our millions of followers and um you know i can't wait for blueface and krishan to come back on it's crazy because you know i'm a player at heart and rule number one is you always act like the other person whether that's somebody y'all fucking on the same dude or somebody had somebody that you had or whatever you always pretend you don't see them ever like you never question ever. about them you never mention it and that's young girls at home even as that one girl thorn in your side, she always seems to fuck the one you fuck in your little small town. You still got to Ray Charles that thing because once you say her name, you breathe life to it. Now, if she never made the call, you can't say that it happened, right? But now that she made the call and she said it happened now, it's like, damn, you corny. You come across corny like that or intimidated. You know what I mean? You're bothered. Like, there's no... For sure. There's no ex there's no ex job there's no ex friend there's no ex anything that i've ex that i'm even thinking about yeah. right now like there's no ex i don't think about loving hip-hop i just did my last contractual obligation while and out that was great i'm off like now i'm over here creating these two books and a show and this i'm i don't look back because what i learned in life is that like we don't drive backwards we don't read books backwards we don't life does not go in reverse life is a continual movement forward so if you're not able to keep moving forward if you let anything distract you from moving forward then you're gonna stay stuck well, now listen. blueface and krishan winning they get numbers they get money bro like a motherfucker yeah, I and, can Tina. and so then now right and so now hilarious we like that shit niggas listen because i had i struggled with the thing with blue first of all i'm a fan of blue face and i'm real big on astrology he's aquarius and i feel that aquarius about him with Krishan, she's from baltimore i have a special love in my heart for baltimore um with them i struggled with it a little bit because i would see so many negative comments about them but i also watched how many motherfuckers sit on that live you know what oh, i mean yeah, and she ain't on there doing dissertations she's picking her fucking nose and playing with her hair so it's like people are attracted to this and i feel like you know what it is because in the ghetto you'll know a couple that fights of course. and that's not crazy to you of course. a lot of people that's never experienced that like my wonderful producer dre dre's a great guy he don't you know i say to dre well me and my nigga last night punched each other in the stomach at target and we fucked real good at the hotel dre's mortified by that because it's like why are you letting this nigga punch you on the stomach why would you punch him in the stomach but motherfuckers back home do know about that and whether it's wrong or right it irritates me that we all supposed to just pretend like it's such this horrible thing even when it um when we talked about what happened on my podcast you know and about how negative it went with the dv stuff it's like yo why aren't we noticing how common it is like how many people have dealt with this versus not dealt with it does that mean that it's not horrible that so many women certain amount of women die per minute and you know but at what point if you're trying to provide entertainment for a person do you say well i can't put this out because this is a bad look and this is going to taint people and influence people i think it's more of a reflection of relationships right now like mm -hmm. that toxicity look at all the rap songs that are made that are supposed to be loving he calling you a bitch they only fuck two other girls i love you i just bite your wrist out and people are like that's my song that's my mm -hmm. favorite mm -hmm. so what do you expect when you see it right in your face chris showing the blue face fucking scene come back on this nigga head leaking she in the mirror that's right queen don't let him disrespect you queen i'm like bust that nigga in his head chris I like it. But this is where, like, one, there's... It's a guilty pleasure, Jason. Loving hip-hop was a guilty pleasure. You know what I mean? Uh, I feel like there's there's a niche market for everybody. We all know a blue face of Krishan in our hood. Like, for sure. I, I, know, I have a friend named Nia. Her sister her sister's dead now, but her sister name, they used to call her Baby Beast. Baby Beast, Naya, and Vani. These were three big black girls in the hood that would go out and beat niggas' asses. Mm. One time, 
uh, Naya, she beat this dude up so bad he shot her twice because mm -hmm. she was she was whooping his ass. So I know girls in the hood who will take off their shoes, come on, and whoop your ass in the street, and then y'all can go back to the hood, drink whatever. So when I, I was fascinated by why the world's fascinated with them, right? That's what I wanted. So you want to see it, and 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 to Coy, like Coy Ray could have came on the show, made it an intentional. Uh, opportunity for her to have bigger numbers than her to shit on them, but yeah. not not do that. Now you right. didn't come on the show. You now we looking at you weird, and, yeah. and now you can't come on the show without me asking you. So you're not gonna come on the show. I'm curious to know what did you say back though? What was your response? Was you just like frozen? I was kind of surprised because that was to me that was more like, and I hate to be the old nigga in the room, but it's like, young girl, don't tell me what the fuck to do on my show, young girl. <laughs> you well, just what, came out. Well, I know I, how to do this. Well, what I said to her was, "This is what I do. Yeah, like this is what I do. Like I've." I've done this. I got this. This is interesting because I never had nobody call. Like, I've never had a new person call me and school me. Right. You know, and then you try to be humble and not say, like, I literally just sat with the vice president of the United States telling her how to get us to help her. So how are you going to tell me how to help you? And then and the, the, so I just kind of listened to her and I said, you know what, whenever you're ready, you let me know. But now, now in my mind, now I know when you come on, I got to ask you these questions. Like, look, I didn't even know about her, their relationship. I happened to be on the phone with somebody else telling them what she told me. And they were like, oh, you know, they used to be together. So I Googled it because I don't even know half the time what's going on. And so it's like, like cuts it up, studio clips of them in the stew together and like, like on each other's story. I knew her today. Yeah. Trippy Ree, and it's so crazy. When I first found her, the first thing stuck out to me is that how creative she was, how much of an individual she was. Her hair, her clothes, nothing about her stood out. She had a very pronounced overbite, like from sucking her thumb, yeah. like the one where niggas rubbed the, the blanket on their face. Yeah. She had that doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the Tyler baby kid joint. And she was cool with it. Yeah. And then when she got big, she got the teeth. I think she got braces or yeah, something. Uh -huh. But I always thought she was really pretty. I always thought that she was bold and um beautiful. I didn't even realize she was Benzino's child at the time. Yeah. And when she went through all that, we had her back. Like she was fearless. She was getting attacked by her dad. She was coming out there every day, just like the courage to keep going. So like for us, the reason why I wanted to interview her is I felt like there's other women out there who are going through their own experience with family or friends or the internet, and you somehow found your courage, so come on here and give them that. That's what I, I was thinking. I wanted to teach her how to cuss people out on the internet. Remember that? That was the only reason why I wanted her on. I wanted to teach her how to clap back because they was calling her sticks and shit. And I'm like, no, clap back. Tell them bitches they belly on their knees. You know what I mean? When you small like that, you clap back. Like, bitch, you see this small back, this waist? <laughs> But she lost Blueface to Krishan. I think that's the real issue that she's no, struggling. No, no, Jason. She yeah. didn't lose him to Krishan. I wouldn't say that. No? No. I think, um, I feel like with Krishan and Blueface, they really, I think the way they met with that Blue Girls Club shit, I think that he really was feeling her. I think that it, it sucks. She's a trooper. She's mm. a fucking trooper. Because she's committed. He, to, he, the, to the to the program, bro. For a nigga to deny and play, and you know, I mean, he's Aquarius. That little baby shit shook his ass up. Now every picture, it's my baby. It's my baby. You know who love you? You gonna put three babies in the nail, right? But that's all oh, you gotta not, do to shake a nigga up. You talking about little baby the rapper, not little baby in her stomach? You gotta rap. I wasn't necessarily convinced about I wasn't, the baby. It was the horseback riding threw me off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not you know what it was to me. It was like the four or five fights back yeah. to back to back on yeah. camera. Because you know sometimes she you beat know, somebody up on the red carpet. She whooped the bitch ass the day she said she was <laughs> yeah, pregnant. Yeah. Right outside, rolling around on the ground. I like a bitch that'll wrestle and fight under a muffler. I, I will say to them, I had a great time with them. Like, did they, you? Yeah, I, I. I mean, it was it for me. I was like in my mind, like I'm gonna be the Barbara Walters. See, I'm gonna figure this shit out because it was <laughs> it was a lot of like maneuvering you know what i mean they were like yeah. all over the place but yeah i enjoyed it and was your interview after because they went viral on after no jumper no, before, before. it was before but we aired it after because boy if it was after, i know you've been looking at them tvs and shit you kick a hole in here no, we we gonna get, you're gonna get the fuck up out of here kicking shit no, that's we, what i thought about yeah. i don't know if drake can handle a Sean and we gotta drag that bitch out oh no we have our security at our shows and you know they they not gonna tear up nobody tearing up that shit and yeah. you know, we've invited everybody can come in but it's a very controlled environment it's a controlled elevator it's all the way at the top, so you're not gonna get down. I want to. I want to yeah, compliment you. Get, yeah. The scene, the um, set is beautiful. You always dressed to impress. You always got some shit Thank on. You. you look really good. I'm happy for you. I feel like you're happy about this. I've seen you do a lot of ventures, but to me, you're very proud about this. You seem very excited. All the promos. That's what made me really want to catch it. I'm like, you could tell this nigga is excited about what he's doing. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about your experience. So, Love and Hip Hop. They called me. Yeah. Um. 
it was I don't think it's for me. You know, I feel like it's definitely a stepping stone in certain careers. Of course, you're going to automatically talk about Cardi. Cardi really in regards to getting in, getting out before it's too late, staying, you know, not staying too long and it helping a little bit. I don't know if it it definitely didn't do a harm. And it seems like she blew up right after. You know what I mean? For you, did you like your experience at Love and Hip Hop? I will say that for you, you should do it. And the reason why you should do it is because it don't hurt us. Like, okay. because we're at, this is the space we're in. Like for artists, it's tricky. You know what I mean? But see, Cardi was a star before the show. The for show sure. just magnified it. For like sure. you're a star in your own right with what you do. Thank you. It's just going to magnify you. It's going to put you in front of the audience faster. When I launched Hollywood Unlock, I didn't have, no door was opening for me. So Love and Hip Hop was the only one that opened. Right. And so I told Mona like, fuck it, I'm going to go do it. I'll make everybody's business my business. I started building Hollywood Unlock as I was getting casted. It wasn't even existing at the time. Got on the show. Every scene I'm in, you could be talking about the weather. I'd be like, yeah, Miss, how does Hollywood Unlock outside? Like, I kept dropping my business name because I used it as a marketing tool. And I kid you not, it worked because Hollywood Unlock seemed like a name that you knew already. It was right. like recognized. Right. So right, you right. did a good job at that. For yeah, but sure. but the but the like how they how they see you and how they want you to be seen to their audience, they're gonna control that. They for had sure. me looking crazy. That's the listen, not listen. You came to another event called Trap Stock and you walked through and everybody chased you. And I was thinking, look at them chasing him. We're gonna turn around and do something. You had a, a scene on there with the drink. Remember that? Yep. That was like a huge thing. Who was that? Hazel, Hazel e? yeah, yeah, yeah. Hazel e is somebody that'll bring that about you, but did it backfire? Do you feel like it was oh, yeah, a real yeah, negative? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, me and Hazel were friends before the drink. It was a moment that, like, it was a moment that I regretted, but I literally just lost control. Right. I've never, I, I try to be tempered and try to be in control of all things because, you know, not because I care about how I look, but just because I care about my character. Like, right, right, I just, right, right. to me, if you would have said, you're going to throw a drink in a woman's face on national television, I would have bet you all the money in my bank it was never going to happen. It wouldn't happen. Because I have five right. sisters and one of them was in an abusive relationship and, you know, we, we didn't allow that to happen for too long. And so I prided myself in, you know, I could read a bitch for filth, but mm -hmm. like throw hands or throw something that now. But she, what I realized in that experience was I just wasn't fully comfortable with myself for the world to say right. he's a gay man because yeah. I feel like because that wasn't a thing. You weren't necessarily the gay guy on Love and Hip Hop. They did be. do that after yeah, that, they and did it that. was like this: the gay guy, this the trade guy, this the half gay guy. It was like a thing. This is yes, and I didn't want my sexual. I didn't want my introduction to the world of business be led by my sexuality because I right. feel like mainstream really does. Um, use gay people as props and sidekicks. You know what yeah. I mean? You look at the reality shows, all the girls got a makeup artist or somebody with heels on and bags and all that. That's cool. That's what they do. That's and not some of them I, niggas make big bank off of it. And that's their program. For that sure. wasn't what I signed up for. So right. they got that out of me in that moment. So yeah, was it a bad thing for me? No. Me and Hazel, Hazel was able to come on my podcast. We were able to piece it up. We're that's cool now. And uh, I apologize to her. She apologized to me. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing because I also feel like all press is good press. Like yeah. how you massage it to work for you is what you got to do with it. I am a hip hop kid I'm born in the eighties. I can I was at a time where it wasn't even like a thing. Like, is this even real music? Like I'm that old, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, loving hip hop is perfect. Like those first seasons were really, really good. There is love and hip hop. So all you really have to do is document it. For me, it just started being so fucking repetitive. It will be like, okay, they find a star. So you get somebody like a Stevie J or Johnson once in a lifetime. Then they try to recreate that. And then they're trying to do the same thing over and, and over. Hollywood for, was Ray J. And then New York, uh, I forgot who, who was New York. Uh, Chrissy and Jim were the first Chrissy stars. and Jim, but even how his mother was, then they, his mama D, and now she's going to yeah, be. Yeah, so yeah, to yeah. me, it it wasn't enough freedom for y'all to really live your life. So we can catch some love in hip hop. It's too much. It was too, it's too much force. And that's the shit that made me nervous because it's like, okay, what if they write it in for me? to be the girl that they talk shit about or whatever, yeah. right? Now we get into a fight, you splash me with some wine, I can't get to you through 10 niggas. Now I'm sitting on your fucking um, Tesla in your driveway, right. in your garage. But that right there. And nobody tapes that fight. But that right there is why I felt like it wasn't for me eventually because this is really how it would happen. Hey, how you been? What's well, How's your kid? Everything cool? You cool? Okay, all right, y'all ready? Okay, sing. Bitch, I got to tell you something. Like, that's what was happening. Right. And I came into a reality show thinking we being real. Right. So the first time somebody played me like that was the Hazel thing. Right. I said to them, I don't want to film with her. Even though we were cool, we just, it just, I know how she operates. She's great for reality TV. She knows how to set that shit off. I didn't want those moments. Right. So once I told them I don't want to shoot with her, 
the first scene was with Nikki talking about her business. And then, oh, by the way, my friend's coming to meet us. And here come Hazel. So it was right. like that set up. Really, <laughs> but they're really great at what they do. But that's why I said when you go in, you got to have a plan. I didn't have a podcast until I threw that drink. And then I said, let me create my own platform so people can see me in my own way of editing. Right. I'm going to control my narrative. I'm going to have my own voice. And that's what really fueled me to create my podcast. And then as the scene the stuff started going on, I used to plan watch parties as it would air so that way I can have people in the room to tell them what happened behind the scenes and in my pocket. It was a whole strategic thing, but it worked though. Yeah. It worked. I would, yeah. would I do it again? I don't know that I would. I don't know that I wouldn't. But at that time, that was the only door that opened and I just ran through it. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it kept you rolling. I told you early before we start, I feel like you had a blog, a gossip blog, whatever you want to call it. You had it before a lot of people had yeah. them. Um, which will make me say you one of the trailblazers to this shit. Um, when I came out and I first started doing certain things and podcasts come through my come through my lap, I was very adamant on trying to stay away from gossip. Now, if I'm gonna report on something, I'm gonna talk about something because I want to have a conversation with me and my people about it. I would, but I'm big on energy and I don't want to put that energy out. So when y'all do get the video of me and my boyfriend fighting at Target, that you might not post it because it's like the mom is not into that. We not even gonna post her with the domestic violence or fighting her baby dad. But all that's at gonna the happen. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. All the voices you talk about social media, all the shift. It's so weird. It starts like for me. It was they love me, love me, love me. Then when I threw the drink, everybody hated me, and then. Uh, then it started to slowly change, and then as you start to elevate, then it then it, then the criticism gets louder and louder. Then the yeah. people that you were that were there for you at first, they turn on you. And I posted something on my Instagram today. It says all the people that are my enemies are somebody that I once helped. Like it's real it's shit. It gets really weird. It's and, crazy. And, and and I can look at you and I see you rising. I see you doing your thing. Just wait. It's gonna I, get interesting. It, it's and I, I talked about it today. It's almost like. The people bring you up and the people kind of give you your position. And as soon as they think you got some Givenchy on, it's like, this bitch ain't real. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I wish people at home would notice it. It's like, you don't notice that once people get a couple dollars or the success, that's when it flips and everybody starts to hate that person. I think it's so, it's so obvious that it's jealousy, it's envy. Yeah, yeah. And it's, but the strange part is that we put these motherfuckers in these positions and then we drag them down. Right. I feel like... Good old Americans, we love those knockout, dragout stories. We love the stories where they come from nothing, they make it, they get it all, and then they lose every fucking thing, and we get to watch that, and then they get redemption where they come back. You or know, they say people get built up to be torn down. Yeah, and then people love a train wreck. Love and Hip Hop was one of the biggest TV shows on television because you wanted to log in to see if, or you wanted to tune in to see if Jocelyn was going to beat up. Uh, or Jocelyn was going to beat up, uh, what's the girl name? Mimi. Mimi or what, you know, what, what craziness was happening? How many kids Peter was going to have? Oh, Peter was something. Do you know that nigga host cheaters now? But, <laughs> but it's smart though. Slap on the knee, ain't it? <laughs> Almost every time when he catch people, the nigga turn around and go, what the fuck you doing here? You cheated on your wife. That's, you know, it's funny. But, but I will say though, job? the crazy part about it is, I think like everybody should celebrate people's come up and then continue to support them as they grow. The one thing, Queen, back to Queen Latifah, what she said to me when I first started Hollywood Unlocked, she called me and she was in New York. She had just ran to Perez Hilton. She said, you know, I just ran to that nigga Perez and you remind me of him, but you're like TMZ and Perez Hilton with a heart. So like, just remember one thing on your career, like in your, on your journey with your career. She was like, really build a strong foundation with the black community, with your people, and then take them on a journey with you and never leave them. Like, they're mm -hmm. gonna support you. You're gonna get hate, you're gonna get criticism. When you cross over, people are gonna, but don't cross them out. Cross over and bring them with you into a world that they don't have access to. And I really feel like people that still wanna go back to my love and hip hop days and live in the storylines, that they didn't let me have a story. They didn't let yeah. you see my family until I went back with clout and. In, in a platform where I said, unless you show my family, unless you show real emotion, unless you let people see me for who I'm I am, not doing I ain't this. doing it because I don't need it, right? And they, they did that and then I left, you know? Um, but yeah, I feel like um, you have to be very intentional. And also one of the lessons I will say with Love, with love and Hip Hop that I will say that I didn't think about then, but I think about now because I had a real big public exit from uh, Viacom where I called them a plantation and how they house a lot of slaves and whatever. Um, <laughs> what I learned is always stay in control of your vision. Cardi did a phenomenal job of knowing what she wanted to do with that show. She got in, she got out, she got her money and she kept going and she never looked back. And I feel like with me, 
I always felt like I needed the show while I was on it in order to be me. And and it wasn't even until like really recent, maybe a couple of years ago, that I said like, I don't really need none of these people. Like I got right. my platform, you got your platform. We we For have sure. an audience. It's just a matter of multiplying and how we cross each other's shows to right. bring the, their audiences into ours. You know, I want you to come on my podcast. You know, I would you love to. Come, on, come into my world. I feel like we all should be helping each other and the audience should just have a little bit more grace because being black, being independent, being in media or entertainment, not looking or conforming like certain people is very fucking hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a lot of people who tried Try to destroy me and try to take me out or whatever and you know i kept moving and i just feel like if we just understood like the struggles that these people are having at their jobs we just having them with a magnifying glass exactly have a little bit of compassion but for me when you're in the business of talking shit people have less empathy for you too because they're like nigga you talk shit about everybody so that's why i learned I, to take it and what i said was i called it a gossip blog you said it's not really gossip tell them why it's not gossip well the first one we we did lowkeymessy.com was gossip okay. that was it was fucking lowkey messy was in the name it was messy as hell and i remember getting people just like they were terrified of me and i hadn't even started yet i was telling people i was gonna do it but Hollywood Unlocked, we try not to gossip. I mean, you we hear stuff and we know stuff and we talk about it and we put it out there. And then eventually, like when Iggy Azalea got pregnant, uh, we put that out there. She said, oh, I'm not pregnant. Then she was pregnant. Right. Then uh, when Erica Mena, we put her pregnancy out there. Uh, then she was mad because we put it out there before her baby reveal happened. So mm. we, we tend to know the facts. Um, of course, with the Queen story, we got that wrong, allegedly. Yeah, that's funny. You know, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you don't consider it gossip. You feel like you just... Well, about I think what's that going when on. it comes to independent black media, we tend to be labeled gossip blogs. Like, you know, Essence isn't looked at as a gossip blog, but I, look at Tamara Hall. What is she doing? Right. She gossiping. Yeah. She's sitting up there. I mean, what she did with Angela Yee and Charlamagne the other day was messy. That was what messy she did with Larsa Pippen fuck. was messy. Like, yeah. she wanted to come in our lane because these talk shows are all dying right now. And Wendy's right. not it's there. It's the, and Wendy is the GOAT. It's crazy. I hate I hated seeing how it ended with Wendy because it really wasn't an ending right. to it. Um, and I'm rooting for her. I'm from Philadelphia. I remember when she came to Philly from being hot, hot fired from Hot 97. And she took over Philadelphia and we loved her. And it was like... From that, it was straight to television. She did it smooth and she did it her way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, to even get away with the how you doing these days is crazy. Right. But to see her like spaced out walking around New York, it sucks. I right. hate it with yeah. them little booty shorts and shit. I don't know who's in charge of that or who's taking her out. And I she always she likes to dress. Bro, she oh, but she always need a nigga to hold her, get grab the door. She really looks very fucking fragile. But she has, I mean, you've seen her ankles, her feet. The she feet has... swell. They just was asking me what's, what was her health thing. And I'm like, I don't know. She got something with her feet. She, yeah, she has swell. Graves disease, and then she has. Um, I thought the, I thought it was a um, an edit. Them feet, that was no, her feet. No. Her feet look like that. That's her feet. I ain't playing. That's how her that nigga feet blue. They blue and they long. Then they're thick. It's a lot of swelling. They big and long and blue, and I love Wendy Williams. This is no hate for me. Yeah. I'm very honest with my shit. But um, she likes a good booty short and a thick boot. And she got long legs, no hips. You know what I mean? Hold the hip. All right. Um. So back to you. So. Let's rewind. So I go to Jason's book and sign it. And yes, I did call him a poppy, but he did sign my book and I read the book and I loved the book. Thank and you. I started my own podcast. My second podcast, my first podcast was horrible. Was Nobody it watched it. The first one was called Cooking Crack, but don't call me white girl. I was still in the streets. I was trying to keep it real. <laughs> Nobody watched it. And then it would be like the old ninja movies. So I would be like, Welcome to Don't Call Me White Girl. Welcome to Don't Call Me White Girl. Like the voice, the, the uh, shit was off uh -huh. or whatever. But it was a good experience. And, and you got to perfect it. It's a, it's a process. It was my first time I did lowkeymessy.com and I walked in a room <laughs> and they were like, he needs to leave. They kicked me out. I was like, what? I just got here. Like, Just what for coming? Lowkey Messy is in the building. Get out. Like, just wow. the whole thing was, that was before the shade room. Yeah. So, so once I saw Shade Room Baller, I'm like, okay, Hollywood Unlocked. I'm just going to pull back the veil of Hollywood. I'm going to do this different. I mean, you know, you, you do any fuck up or you pivot. You... Has anybody ever ran up on you on some smoke? Yeah. I mean, I always there's always people who are mad. I mean, there's nobody that's like they really want to smoke. I know physical shit. No, no, no. Yeah. But people want to like yell or I'm a citizen, number one. But I also have a lot of people that are in the streets who do love what I do and okay. who do look out for me you and make sure that I'm good. from Stockton, nigga. Funny story. Recently, I had a, a situation at my studio where I was doing an interview and somebody's publicist was cutting up. Mm. I've never had it happen like where a publicist is cut up in the middle of an interview or anybody just like, inter, inter, but they didn't know like my cousin was in the other room and she's from the hood. Like she's, she's at church with a gun in her purse every Sunday. Mm. 
she came out and it was like really about to be a thing. She didn't even understand. I'm like, yo, you go back in there and relax because I'm working and you don't ever talk while I'm talking. Sorry. Like, you know, but I just feel like people, they say all that internet shit and they want to do this and that, but people really don't want to be about they that. Really they don't. really don't. That's why sometimes I didn't know if I would fit in because it's like, yo, certain shit, I'm asking you when I see you and that's totally normal where I'm yeah. from. But at the same time, I'm trying to keep this shit rolling and I don't want to be sued, but it's like, You bitch, can't be sued for asking questions. You yeah. can, you can, what you heard, are, there's a rumor out there, do you want to clear it up? Yeah, let's clear it up. Like any, But the thing about it is when people come in, like when we first started before with the camera scenario, you said, uh, there's nothing that I can't ask, right? No, I don't care because I stand in all my truth. That's right. I stand in because what, what, whatever I'm afraid of, there has to be some truth to it. Ain't, right. there ain't no truth to it. What, what are we talking about? Yeah. So I feel like, you know, one thing at our show, I, I just say to people, like, don't come here with the list of what I can't ask. Okay. Because this ain't that show. Yeah. You wouldn't do it to Oprah. You wouldn't do it with two white girls. That's Why you a do fucking it fact. That's yeah. a fact. It hasn't, it hasn't happened a lot, but I did have somebody where we were like from the same area and they were like, this is off limits. And the whole time, I didn't even know whatever the local gossip was. I'm See, like, bitch, relax. Times the off limits shit, you don't even be aware of until they Fuck, put it in your now face. You and got now me it's in thinking. your mind while I'm talking to the whole interview. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you did use yourself, pussy. Anyway, <laughs> so I go to the book sign and it was amazing. He signs the book, I call him Poppy by Mistake. Fast forward, I start my podcast, the bigger one, which one is this one. We go viral for the first time with my girl, my friend in did we real post life. It on Hollywood Unlocked? Y'all did, because let me tell you. Because it was viral as fuck. It was viral as fuck. Had it, to post it. it went viral in a negative way. Um, the DV uh, comments were made. Then she went live and the shit but was what's the DV? Remind me of the DV comment. This is what the joke was. Because a lot of that podcast, we were just fucking around. And let me put this part out there first. I had this podcast. I was averaging 30, 50,000 views. I have this super famous friend and we're friends because she thinks I'm hilarious. Always been motivating. Yo, you need to keep going. You funny. This bitch would be on my live and it was a hundred people on there. This is Ari. This is Ari. Just yeah. finds me in Philadelphia while she's in Chicago. We end up building a friendship. She says, I'm doing your podcast. At the time, I didn't even realize she had never did an interview. When you Google it, you can't find them anywhere. This shit about to turn my podcast the fuck up and I didn't even realize it. I went from 30, 40,000 views to 600, 700, thousand just because of her she did it for no other reason but like go black girl go knowing where i come from and then all these people are dragging us about a joke the joke was yeah i like for him to pull a gun out and not let me leave if he wanted like if i'm about to okay, leave yeah, i'm gonna walk that. out the house yeah mm -hmm. he'll pull a gun and it was in a joking matter we, we were talking about eating ass um everything that you could think of would you say Spitting in your mouth. It was real, real kinky. Niggas was drinking Casamigos. That one little line went ape shit. And then when she went live, people really didn't like what she said when she went live. She in turn ended up losing the Finney deal. But that encouraged her to get Remedy going, which is going really well. So I, I'm a strong believer, of, a firm believer of everything happens for a reason. But Hollywood Unlocked did, did DM me and say, do you mind if we post a clip of your podcast? And my response was, oh, my little basement podcast? And they were like, what? Because of course it's not you. Jason went on his show reporting about the comments going viral and your exact words were I told y'all stop doing these raggedy ass basement podcasts you should have came on here and I was pissed I was like were you, you see pissed? what the fuck Jason said about my podcast I was pissed but it wasn't like real pissed because when you end it you like um, you should have came on here so that's where the comment yeah. come from really and it almost made me think like Jason Lee seen my podcast you Wait, know what I, I'm saying can I say something this is the gag though First of all, don't ever tell your guest before you do the interview that you're going to shade them. Do it. Like, I didn't even remember that. You should have just surprised my ass and, got and just you. got me. But let me tell you this. Um, one, I didn't even know that was you. Second of all, it reminds me of when I first started Hollywood Unlocked. I wanted to be on the Wendy Williams show so fucking bad. That Did when, you? Because she's the queen. She's yeah, like she the is. icon, she right? Is. Yeah, and so huge. she brings Milan and Miles on the show from Love and Hip Hop and not me. And I'm waiting like, say my name, say my name, say my name. And so she's like, so you guys are the only gay guys on the show, right? They're like, no, Jason Lee's on there. She was like, well, besides him. She ain't even like acknowledge oh, me. God. But hold on. Then I go and I interview Khalees. And Khalees said Nas beat her. First time she had ever talked about her relationship. He was everywhere. And Wendy had to talk about it. And she goes, who the fuck is Jason Lee? Who was he? Like, how oh, he get God. the interview? I'm going to send you the clip. She said that. And I was at home saying, she said my name, she knows me. And then I went on her, then I went on her show and we became friends. And it was a moment where like, when I think about it, 
I know exactly how to be my gagging with Jason Lee show where I was talking all my shit, mm-hmm. and now I'm here on your show. Yeah, it's lit. That's so it's crazy because I, I swear this whole time I have never said I'm going to do this and I'm gonna meet this person. I'm gonna, I've only said I'm going to be myself and I'm gonna put it out there, and if they fuck with it, they fuck with it. I'm never going to push it too hard. I'm never going to go crazy. I'm never even going to count the views and feel bad if it don't go and I promise you it's work like every fucking thing I've tried is work and I feel like damn I wish I would because I was going to jail struggling not knowing and I never thought that I would be somebody like any success that I thought I would have I thought I would have it in a legal way and the problem with that is you may go to jail and leave your kids you know so this has felt like a blessing from the door so a piece of me thought I am going to be in the same room with Jason Lee I'm going to have this conversation we're going to chuckle about it but but let me say where you're doing better than me you're doing it by yourself See, I built Hollywood Unlocked. I built my podcast with Melissa Ford and the, and Giovanni, and I always had co-hosts. And I'm just now coming into doing it by myself, the Jason Lee Show, because I want my fan base to be there for me. I right. want, I want, I don't want to hear the this co-host and that co-host and this and this and this one to leave. It's all about me. So you yeah. built it all about you, and yeah. I've, I see your growth. Like I said, I was downstairs telling my people, I don't really do a lot of interviews that like is not like my people that I have a relationship with because I like to go and have fun I like everything I do to not feel like work but I've been watching you I've been watching you I do look at the uh, comments I do look at how many comments and followers I see you building and growing and it just took me back to where like when I first got to get how passionate I was and then when you do get a lot of money and you do you do get now you don't get lazy but you kind of be like comfortable you get comfortable and I got comfortable and then I had burnout and then I just quit everything and then I came back with something that you now and I appreciate you saying that see like I'm real passionate about yeah, you can believe tell in. So, yeah I see which I see you moving you, you even when I was at breakfast club I was like I know y'all about to have her on here because you 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 know, they need that type of energy and you're for bringing sure. it something. For sure. This was something that was po- meant to be. And be clear, we're not in the basement. This is not the basement. <laughs> just so we're very fucking clear. And isn't, can I ask you one question? Yes. Isn't it crazy though how many people would define you or your show based on a clip? Yeah, for sure. But remember some all clips matter. Yeah, they Who do. Who gives a fuck? It, and, then, and then when it goes viral, go live. You and your you and your baby daddy, y'all should have had some boxing gloves. Y'all should have been <laughs> Floyd Mayweathering it out. And but you know what? It's one of those things where the internet has a bunch of people who live perfect lives. I know. In a in a very fake way and mm-hmm. judge everybody else. So yeah, keep giving them the shit they want to talk about. Yeah, for sure. I'm so glad that you came. I think this was a good episode. You think, Dre? I'm excited. Um, I do have just two more questions real quick. We scrapping the voicemail and all that. Okay. Kanye, the experience of working with him in the middle of all that shit. How was that? What What, what was your title when he hired you, when you all were working together? What yeah. were you, a publicist? No, I was head of media. So head of media, okay. He was going to build this conglomerate under the Donda brand that had multiple divisions, one of them being media, and there was a plan to acquire all these uh, media companies to have them all function as one conglomerate. And so I was going to lead that. So we started the conversations with that. And then we brought in a PR team to help him level set and control his narrative. And then we had a whole plan. And then, you know, his life showed up the way it did. Right, right. And unfortunately, it didn't work out. You know, it's been interesting sitting back watching um, the selective outrage with him and the despair treatment of cancel culture because I really feel like cancel culture is the shit that is cancerous for our community, is it, our culture. It's crazy. Yeah, but it's, it was an interesting experience. You know, I did my little seven month um, bid. Yeah. And got about it there. It was huge though. That was like, damn. Do you feel like people looked at you differently after or during? Because I mean, I'm not going to front. Somebody like Kanye, when he chooses somebody for something like that, it's like, damn, it makes you like, you know, what the it, fuck it, do you, I think, you I think in many way? ways, People see going back to that blogging thing, right? Blog or gossiping. People will put you in a box, right, right, where they feel comfortable. Because to say that I am influential is a threat. To say, to see, you know, when I put the pictures up, sitting down having coffee with the vice president, or in Dubai doing whatever, or with Floyd Mayweather as an openly gay man, or over here releasing Rihanna's baby photos, they like why all these people fuck with him. Right. He's just a blogger. Mm-hmm. He's just a gossiping, messy. F- well. That's what I may be to you, and that's unfortunately you preventing yourself from getting a bag with me, uh, having a great experience with me, um, you know, maybe finding a finance nigga with me, whatever it is. <laughs> I just laugh at it because ultimately I realize that as long as I got them talking, I'm winning. As yeah. long as I got them talking, I'm winning. So yeah, I just I, I looked at like the yay thing in many ways validated the type of mind that I have as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, as somebody that knows how the internet works, who knows how to burn the internet down and also how to put out fires on the internet so that i think validated me in different ways right and made people go what because then now you're 
sitting down with the Madonnas and people are calling you and asking for advice that probably would have never called you and you know you're able to help them in ways that they never knew you it's could. fucking lit jason last question usually on this podcast we have manifestation um where i say where i manifested because i manifested my whole career i kid you not i'm not supposed to be here this is all me being positive as as, as i can be um for you i don't want to ask you what your manifesto what is your goal like even with your show what's your final goal like your your end goal with a lot of this shit yeah i mean i really look at like now hollywood unlocked started as a media platform that created shows now we're looking at how we develop into a network that has a news platform because i feel like with all the relationships all the brands all the ideas that i may have or ideas that i see that people have i want to start creating more content so creating shows that don't involve me being on camera i want to be less on camera Okay, yeah. more behind the camera. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'm glad you joined me. Hopefully, we built a friendship here. Yeah, I'll give you my number. You come on my podcast. All right, for sure, Poppy. All right, <laughs> we'll see you next time. All right, So, I got to appreciate you, Jason. I really do. One more thing. If you could give, because that's the biggest question I get from people. Where do I start? What do I do? How do I do? It's oh. people that want to, the young Jason Lees or the yeah. young female Jason Lees that want to get in the game or do stuff similar to you. What advice could you give them? Look, I will say one thing that I learned on this journey was how hard it was to raise money uh, when I was looking for investment. How hard it was to get in the door. How hard it was to network. How to leverage my network. When to say yes. When to say no. The power in both. Uh, how to create strategic enemies and strategic partners. So I launched a whole university. Well, first I launched the courses. So MediaMillionaires.com. You can go there right now. Got these courses, giving you everything from how I trademarked my businesses to how I started them. I mean everything. And then I'm launching a university where I'm going to do biweekly coaching sessions <clears throat> with large groups of people to kind of guide them and give them ideas. You know, you and personally, me coaching. personally, that's yeah. what's up. And so what you know, because I feel like. It's so dope that I figured it out when so many people tried to stop me or didn't want to give me help or didn't want to give me advice or didn't want to share my content that now, like, I'm not going to be a hater. I'm going a, I'm to a make it available for people who want to get what's on. Up, Jason. But I will say, if you're young and you want to do it, like, she's a testament you can do it. I'm a testament you can do it. But you got to fucking want to do it, be able to invest in yourself. And the other thing, too, is you got to be ready to work your motherfucking ass off. For sure. Like, the one thing that Floyd told me, when I thought I was in it because everything was moving, he goes, you know, always have always um, put in that hard work and stay dedicated. And then I thought things were moving and, and they were moving. But Floyd, one day he called me and I was excited because I had just went and met with this big producer about doing a talk show. And this producer sat me down in his office and I'll tell you off camera who it is because this was some shady shit. Mm -hmm. And he asked me all these questions and I told him the ins and outs of my business and how I built it brick by brick and how I do this and how I go viral and how I do. And when I told this nigga turned around and did a whole nother show with a whole nother group of people. Oh God. But it failed. And when it failed. I've heard that so many times though shit But like when that. it failed, the day that I found out that the show was going greenlit, I was sitting down with the people who bought the show and I told them that show is gonna fail because that show is missing one ingredient. You. Me nigga. Right. And so the show ended up failing and I was at home clapping like, yeah, you niggas is unemployed now. You niggas ain't got shit. But you know what I learned there too? I learned like, People, like going back to what you said earlier, you got to be willing to be a, so obsessed with what you do that you don't even cry about a, a sleepless night. You don't cry about missing a birthday party. You don't cry that you don't get to go home and see your family. You don't cry that you spent every dollar you have. You literally are so excited to lose it all because when you get on the other side of it, you're going to look back over all them days like, damn, like that shit really gave me the fucking strength I need to be able to walk in a room knowing my impact. I walk in the room now, can suck the whole air out of the room when I walk in. And I just be like, hey, how y'all doing? And in my mind, I'm laughing because I'm just Jason, but they're so threatened by black ownership and the freedom that we have as content creators working outside that ecosystem where we can literally just turn on our cameras you and say whatever we want. Nobody. You don't, need, don't need, nobody. need nobody. And that's what yeah. I think annoys me about most about the question because a lot of times when you have to come to somebody like me or you, especially especially you, when you got all these years in, you had somebody, what should I do? Can you give me advice? It's like you're not even trying if that's if this is a part of your plans. Right. I'm going to get with somebody that's on top and doing all this and ask them, what can I do? You have to start. Right. Now, while you starting and you working, you want to ask people questions, fine. But for the most part, starting if it feels right and you feel like you're giving it all, you're all, then you're on the right path. Right. Because it'll turn into what it's supposed to be. It always does. Always. And the picture don't always look like what you think it's going to look like. 
but you're going to enjoy it. But the other thing, too, is like, don't be afraid to share resources. Like, I don't know who None your partner. None of that gatekeeping shit. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not into that. Like, I, you should come to my award show this year. We had one last year. You should, like, if there's a relationship we have with an advertiser you need, we, like, I haven't, because I feel like when you bless other people, God blesses you back. It's a fact. I've had people turn on me, and I kind of look at it like, you know, they go and turn on me and say whatever they say. You just promote me, nigga. It's free press. I like when people talk about me, like mm -hmm. good or bad. They can say whatever. The day they said, the day they went online and said he lost all that weight, he had HIV. I went and did a whole PSA on my STD results. I'm like, yep, I went and got, I ain't got chlamydia, I ain't got herpes. Your man do because he tried to fuck. I got, <laughs> you know, that was a joke. But uh, no, you know, I learned that to embrace the good and the bad because yeah. ultimately our, we're in the business of getting people to talk. So yeah, Keep well, for sure, I really do appreciate you sliding through. I really of do, course. and I want to come on your podcast and I want to come to the award show. I get to dress me because. I'm going to lose all that weight for them injections. Thank you, people at home. Um, them injections are real, though. You're fucking welcome. Don't call me my girl, Jason Lee. It's a big deal. In, in the penthouse. That was good.